sounds like a story to me Some crazy fable that you would not believe Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe, where we listen to some of the greatest stories ever written. Adored by Ursula Le Guin, Neil Gaiman, Leonard Nimoy, Ray Bradbury, and Stephen King. Enjoy classic tales such as Are All the Seas with Oysters, The Golem, Sources of the Nile, and many others. Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe. I'm Robert Eversman. Today's episode is very special. It's featuring Laura Scott, and we're discussing A Quiet Room with a View. Quick thing while we were recording, I clicked hide self view on Zoom, just got tired of seeing myself, and then suddenly in the recording, I'm not there. So while you're watching, my picture won't be there, but you'll hear my voice, my strange disembodied voice. Sorry if that is suddenly a little weird, but great episode. This is such an interesting story. It's from the investigations. It's a really intriguing story. So stay tuned. This is A Quiet Room with a View featuring Laura Scott. Hello, listeners. You are listening to the Avram Davidson universe with me, Emma Spear, and me, Robert Eversman. We have a very special guest on today. Yeah, super special guest. Very happy to have her on the show. Uh, Today, we have Laura Scott, and Laura Scott lives south of Portland, so Portland, Oregon, with her Irish husband, her all-seeing, all-knowing teenage daughter, and her sock-stealing dog, Pluto. She makes her living as a college composition instructor, helping others to write. And we are reading A a Quiet Room with a View from The Investigations. That was written in 1964, right? I believe 1964, uh, and then, yeah, published later in The Investigations. So it'll be similar to when we read with with Seth, uh, the third sacred well of the temple. Very mm-hmm. cool. Be, yeah. Yeah. Get ready to investigate, listeners. All right. Let's Indeed. dive in. Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe. I'm Robert. This is. I'm Emma. Hey, Emma. And we have a special guest today. Very exciting. This is my sister, Laura Scott. Laura, please welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Laura, what did you think of the story? What do you think of A Quiet Room with a View? Oh, I loved it. Hmm. I really liked it a lot. I'm excited to listen to it. It's going to be fun. We're going to listen to it in the podcast today. I wanted to read this one with you because, so Laura is a teacher and a writer uh, and an editor, and Laura really loves detail and is very good at writing detail. And I thought A Quiet Room with a View, yeah, great details. I knew that you the writing thing, but I didn't know the detail thing. And I wish now I'm excited to hear your perspective because it wasn't something I was paying attention to necessarily. Yeah, what did you think of some of the details or did it, any stand out to you before we get into it? I think, um, you know, and I didn't read the introduction before I read the story, which was a good thing, but definitely mm-hmm. the, the food that was called out in yeah, the introduction. The, ch- <laughs> the chicken thighs, yeah. The- the crispy, the crispy brown on the chicken thigh. That was important. And um, that's something that, I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about too when we, when we talk about elements that you could pull out and really work with a class on is definitely yeah. detail. Um, so I, I loved that part of it, but I also liked the economy too. And there's some economy in there also that I thought worked really well. So good balance. Hmm. When you say the economy, what do you mean? Mm, so there and this well Emma this is going to get to your question but really like Let's two go things back. we're just Let's going back. around the two of the things that I I think that if I were sharing with a class that I'd really highlight are the details so you know talking about um the the descriptions of food some of the detail like um well, I won't get into the, I won't give anything away, but um, there's a, there are other details in there too, but primarily around food. And then the economy that I'm thinking of is just, um, not, there's not a lot of telling that's happening, which I really like. So there's a lot of showing, there's a lot of dial, very dialogue heavy, but not a lot of kind of explanation um, in between. And so there's this economy of the wording that is really left to the characters to speak it and for us to kind of identify what we want from the story, um, but not a lot of explanation, which, um, which I really liked. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel that. So then now let's listen to A Quiet Room with a View by Avram Davidson. A Quiet Room with a View. A Quiet Room with a View was published in 1964. It takes place in a retirement home. I remember reading this story as it poured out of Avram's typewriter and loving it. There is a wonderful description of a chicken thigh as the tastiest part of the chicken, and lovely descriptions of buttery mashed potatoes and hot apple turnovers, too. How we laughed when we read the story aloud. It must have been just before dinner. In 1964, the grim reality of living in a retirement institution seemed very far away. The years passed, and Avram's health declined until he, too, was confined temporarily in a retirement facility. Then the laughter faded, and the dark side of this warm yet chilling story became very real. G.D. Precisely at midnight, as always, in a predestined order and immutable sequence, Mr. Stanley C. Richards was awakened to the tortures. Midnight. The bells in the cathedral began to toll, twelve strokes. At one, Mr. Richards awoke and was reminded of where he was, which meant he was also reminded of where he was not. Sighed, gripped the covers. At three, Mr. Nelson Stucker awoke, quite obviously not reminded of where he was or was not, and began to call the name of his dead wife. At seven, Mr. Thomas Bigelow, snatched from slumber by the uncertain cries of Mr. Stucker, began to cough. He coughed whenever he was awake, long, slow, deep, ropey, phlegmy, chest-rattling coughs. During the day, as if ashamed, he preferred to keep out of earshot. At the far end of the garden, in the nearby park, in an unfrequented chapel in the cathedral, even in bad weather, in the basement. But at night, poor man, where could he go? And at the stroke of ten, Mr. Amadeo Palumbo, jolted from dreams of the dank little fruit and vegetable store where he had been busy and happy for forty years, jolted into remembrance that not only the store, but the very building had been torn down to make room for a housing project which had no need for fruit and vegetable stores. Mr. Palumbo moaned out his woes and grief and loneliness in the language of his childhood. Oh, Jesu Mary, he keened. Oh, San Giuseppe, San Giacom. And so, by twelve, by the last stroke of the chimes, a stroke echoing infinitely in the clamoring darkness, the tortured pattern of the night was established forever. The nights seemed to last forever, there in that room under the eaves of the old building, full, overfull, in plain fact, of old men and old women. Bedtime was at half past ten, and at half past ten, the four old men in the attic room overlooking the air shaft sank quickly enough into slumber, tired out by the fatigue of having lived through another day. But by midnight, they were all near the surface again. It wasn't really that the chimes were noisy or unpleasant. On the contrary, they were soft, melodious chimes, world-famous, as was the cathedral itself, to which the Alexandra home for aged couples and elderly men was attached by some loose denominational ties. It wasn't really the chimes so much that awakened Mr. Stanley Richards, who had lived within sound of church bells before and could easily have slept through them. It was the sure awareness of what was yet to come that killed his slumbers at the sound of the first stroke. It was Mr. Stucker who was unused to the sound of chimes. Mr. Stucker was very old indeed, and while he knew well enough in the daytime that he was a widower and had been one for many years, he forgot it in the nighttime. Forgot it again and again and again. 
shallow sleep, vexed by slight cause. He knew only that he was awakened to find himself not in the double bed in which most of the nights of his life had been passed. He found himself in a strange bed now, without the proper presence of his wife, from whom he had not been parted for a single day or single night until parted by her death, death which he could not or would not remember in the darkness. So, dong, 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 and... Henny, called old Stucker. Henny, Henny, and finally frightened louder and louder. Henny, Henny, thus awakening Mr. Bigelow in the next bed to his ungovernable and shameful coughing, coughing which only grew worse as he tried to stop it. Poor coughing Mr. Bigelow. Where could he go and hide his cough in the cold and hostile night? So, in a matter of seconds, Mr. Bigelow woke up old Amadeo, who knew on the instant exactly where he was and where he was not, and why, and that he could never return. Never. So the nice cool basement store, which, a coolness so good for the beautiful fruit, the lovely vegetables and the sweet familiar smell of them, and the familiar customers whom he had served for more than a generation in the old neighborhood, faults and all, which had been... Ah, fatal change of tense. More than a home. His life, gone. Gone forever. Urbanly renewed into a giant complex of giant box houses with no crowded streets, no saloons, no restaurants, no little candy stores, no push carts. And no basement fruit and vegetable store for Amadeo Palumbo. Oh, Jesu, he wept. Oh, Santa Maria. And so the cycle would go throughout the whole night. Mr. Richards was not bothered by chimes. He missed no wife. He had no cough. He mourned for no lost occupation or familiar home or place. He wanted only to sleep. And he could not sleep because his roommates could not let him. Wake up. Wake up there, Richards. You getting senile or something? Falling asleep while people are talking to you? Mr. Hammond shook him into wakefulness. Mr. Richards snapped his head up, smiled. Sorry for that, he said. Not very polite, in my opinion, grumbled Mr. Hammond. Now, Harry, his wife said. Don't you now harry me, Alice. They were all in the sun parlor at the front of the first floor. Mrs. Hammond smiled over her knitting. Mr. and Mrs. Darling looked distressed. Senile was not a nice word at the Alexandra home. Mr. Hammond grunted, creased his newspaper. That's a habit I got into many, many years ago, Mr. Richards began. What, falling asleep when people are talking to you? Hammond wouldn't let go. No, taking cat naps. Many times we'd have to march all night through the jungle and then, in the daytime, set one man on guard, and the rest of us would just fall down and curl up, sleep for, oh, not more than five or six minutes, then jump up and start marching again. Mr. and Mrs. Darling stopped looking distressed and started looking interested. Mrs. Hammond paused her knitting. Her husband unfolded his paper again and said, Man writes here, as I was saying, Richards, before you fall asleep on me, man writes here, but Mr. Darling was evidently not interested in what a man wrote there. His eyes wider than before, he leaned forward and asked, Was this when you were fighting the Bolivians in that Grand Shaco War, Mr. Richards? Once again, firmly and loudly rattling his paper, Mr. Hammond said, Man writes here that... But Mr. Darling, even louder, said, Hey, Mr. Richards, fighting the Bolivians? With an apologetic smile to Mr. Hammond, who scowled, Mr. Richards said, Well, point of order, Mr. Darling, in the Grand Chaco War, I was fighting with the Bolivians against the Paraguayans. By that time, the catnap habit had been established for many years, as far as I was concerned, and I taught it to my men. Nicaragua, fighting the bandit Sandino. 
Venezuela, trying to overthrow the tyrant Lopez, he chuckled, as if reminded of something. Mr. Darling, his face now bright with vicarious enjoyment, said, Hey, Mr. Richards, what? Asking the pardon of the ladies for telling a slightly improper story, the ladies at once assumed an expression both surprised and insistent, but reminding them that the Latin race had different customs from our own, Mr. Richards proceeded to inform them that Lopez, though never married, had had many children. Oh, for goodness sake, said Mrs. Hammond. Well, I never, said Mrs. Darling, a featureless, dumpy woman, though inoffensive enough. But Mrs. Hammond was a very good-looking person, her skin still firm and pink, and her snow-white hair neatly set. Tyrant though he was, Lopez was nevertheless in his own way a sort of what you might call a gentleman, and he had legally acknowledged all his natural children, as the expression goes, and had been legitimized. One day, Colonel Lindbergh flew down to Venezuela and was met at the airport by President Lopez and a number of his children, who presented Colonel Lindbergh with a bouquet of flowers. Lindbergh took the bouquet and asked, Are they natural? And Lopez had replied, Yes, but legitimate. Mr. Hammond snorted, amused despite himself. Mrs. Hammond laughed softly. Mrs. Darling sat absolutely impassive, while her husband smiled and awaited more, obviously not realizing that the anecdote was completed. So Mr. Richards explained, Lindbergh meant were the flowers natural flowers or artificial flowers, but Lopez, when he heard him say, are they natural, thought he was talking about the children, so... Finally getting the point, Mr. Darling laughed and laughed and wiped his eyes. Well, well, you certainly have had an interesting life, he said. How many wars have you been in, anyway, might I ask? Mr. Richards smiled, shook his head. Ah, I really couldn't say. Some of them weren't big enough to count as wars, I suppose. Mr. Darling started counting on his fingers. Well, you were in the First Balkan War, I believe you said. Uh, yes, and the Second Balkan War, too, right? Against those Turks, terrible people they must have been in those days. And the First World War, and uh, the Chinese Revolution, and helping the Polish fight for the independence from the Russians, and... He lost track and began to renumber his fingers. Giving his newspaper one final slap before thrusting it into his pocket, Mr. Hammond said... I suppose you call yourself a soldier of fortune? Well, I... Well, it seems to me, seems to me, Richards, you were nothing more than just a plain hired killer. Mr. Darling's mouth went round. Mrs. Hammond cried, Harry! A mercenary killer, that's all. Harry, shame on you! Mr. Richards hesitated, but before he could speak, Mrs. Darling did. Her mind moved slowly, very slowly, and when a word or reference entered, it often took minutes for the effect to become visible. Mr. Richards, she said now, oblivious of her husband's shock, his friend's embarrassment, Mr. Hammond's anger, or Mrs. Hammond's indignation. I want to ask you something. Did those Turkish men really have all those wives locked up in a harem, like they say, or is that only a story? I would like to know. His face clearing, Mr. Richards was ready to answer. But he was forestalled by the canny Mr. Hammond, who said, Chicken for dinner today. Instantly forgetting all about every Turk who ever lived, about wives, harems, and all, Mrs. Darling said, Chicken for dinner? Pursing his lips and nodding deeply, Mr. Hammond said, Yep chicken for dinner. A nice chicken thigh, hmm, Mrs. Darling? Eagerly and with animation, she said, oh yes, I always say that there's nothing like a chicken thigh because the back is too bony and the breast is too rich and the leg has all those grizzles on it and as for the wing, well, it has hardly anything on it, but the thigh, I always say the thigh is just right. Well now, look here, Mr. Hammond. Mr. Richards began, but Mr. Hammond, who had been through this battle before, wasn't ready to retreat. 
Yes, you're absolutely right, Mrs. Darling, he said. A nice chicken thigh with a brown crust on it, and maybe some mashed potatoes on the side, eh? Wouldn't that just touch the spot? She had been listening and nodding and smiling. Now, she exclaimed, why, that's just what I always say. Yes, a brown crust on it and mashed potatoes. Why, Edgar always used to love the way I made my mashed potatoes, didn't you, Edgar? Edgar? Edgar Darling reluctantly shifted his attention from Mr. Richards. Wars, revolutions, soldiers of fortune, Latin dictators with natural children, and then, right here and now, an insult. Still looking eagerly at his adventurous friend, he began to swivel around to face his wife. Hey, Mabel? What? what? Didn't you used to love the way I made my mashed potatoes? Mr. Hammond was just saying, oh, a nice chicken thigh with a brown crust and some nice mashed potatoes would just touch the spot right now. And I was telling him how you used to love the way I made my mashed potatoes. The way I made them was... She explained to the smiling, interested Mr. Hammond. After I mashed them, I used to put in a little milk and a little buttermilk, too, and salt and pepper and a nice big lump of butter. Edgar used to say, you sure don't stint or skimp on the butter, do you, Mabel? And I'd say, no, I don't believe in it. And meanwhile, I'd be frying a nice onion chopped up fine, and then I'd mix it all together. And oh, Edgar, he just loved it. Didn't you, Edgar? We had such a nice home, she added her mood suddenly destroyed. The Turks. An apple turnover is very nice, Mr. Hammond observed. Old Mrs. Darling's mouth, which had begun to quiver, slowly began to smile. Yes, she said. I always say that a nice apple turnover is very nice, provided the crust, she said earnestly. The crust is flaky. And the way to make a nice flaky crust is that you take... Later in the afternoon, the sun was overcast, and many of the residents who had been on the sun porch went into the lobby to sit near the coal fire, or went into the music room to watch television. A number of people were taking naps in their rooms, among them Mr. Harry Hammond. Mrs. Alice Hammond came into the lobby from the elevator and looked around. Stanley C. Richards was sitting at one end of a sofa, gazing at the play of colors among the glowing coals in the grate. He seemed depressed. She sat down next to him, and he looked up. He smiled, but only for an instant. Oh, hello, Mrs. Hammond. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Richards. It's gotten quite misty out, I see. Yes, yes, quite misty, he agreed absently. Of course, now it's just making everything dark and dull outside, but this morning, were you up early this morning? Did you notice from your window how enchanting it was? The view of the cathedral and the park, with that very nice light mist over everything? He smiled rather wryly, but again his smile did not last. Afraid not, Mrs. Hammond, my window doesn't have a view of anything except the air shaft. Oh, that's a pity. We have such a lovely view, and it's so nice and quiet, too. Well, and I am sorry that I never got to hear your answer to Mrs. Darling's question about the Turkish women, either. In the harem? In the harem. Their eyes met, sharing the joke for a moment. Then she looked down, fumbled for her knitting, and said, I'm afraid Harry wasn't very nice to you this morning. We had quite a quarrel about it, the biggest one we've had since the one we had about the cemetery. Do you know about that one? She was surprised he didn't. She thought everyone in the home knew about it. Many members of Mrs. Hammond's family and many of her friends were buried in Green Lawn Cemetery. It was quite a ride by public transportation, true, but there was a nice clean coffee shop only a block from the grounds where you could stop and have a cup of tea and a piece of cake. And Green Lawn was so beautiful. Not that she wouldn't want to go if it weren't. That made no difference. Family was family, and friends were friends, and you didn't stop caring for them just because they were gone, did you? 
What harm was there in going once a month, or even once a week, to pay your respects? To take a few flowers, to find comfort in how nicely everything was kept, to say a little prayer from the heart. Was there anything wrong with that? None that I can see, Mrs. Hammond. Nor I, but Harry, he won't go. He just (laughs) will not go. And he won't let me go either. Oh, not that he ever says, I forbid you to go, or anything like that, but he gets so nasty, so unpleasant, and he carries on so whenever I so much as mention it that, well, much as I want to go, I don't. Not anymore. And it's the same way about funerals. He won't go. Last month, a very old and dear friend of ours passed on. We were indebted to her for many kindnesses, and she had asked me to take charge of the funeral arrangements. That is, everything was paid for. Things like the flowers and the hymns and the guest list and things like that. I don't mind saying that in the past I did take care of such arrangements for the funerals of various friends and relatives. I liked to see that everything was carried out nicely. It's the last thing, almost, that you can do, you know? But Harry wouldn't let me. Jenny asked me to, Harry, I said. She was your friend, too. Who else helped you with those liberty bonds and took such a loss, too, if not Jenny? I asked him. But he said she wouldn't know the difference. And he got so angry. He worked himself into one of his attacks. And so, of course, I couldn't take care of any arrangements. And so it was all left to strangers. I hope you don't mind my telling you all this. It was not often that Mr. Richards had occasion to talk to Mrs. Hammond alone, and he found that he enjoyed her company. Perhaps her current conversation was not the most cheerful imaginable, but it was appropriate for a person of a respectable age to think about. And certainly it was preferable to listening to endless monologues about gallbladders and mashed potatoes and the ingratitude of children or how old Mr. X had supposedly cheated old Mr. Y at checkers or what a fine woman the late Mrs. A, B, or C had been. No, Mr. Richards didn't mind. And then she absolutely astonished him. Harry is so resentful about you, she said, because your life is so much richer than his. What? He was dumbfounded. Oh, yes. Her clear blue eyes looked at him candidly. You've been everywhere, and you've done everything, and he hasn't been anywhere, and he hasn't done anything. He wouldn't have known what an adventure looked like. Harry spent all his life working for various linen importers. There is nothing duller in this world, believe me. So he has nothing to look back on and nothing to look forward to. That's why he's so angry when people would rather listen to you tell about your different military experiences fighting for liberty in foreign countries than to hear him talk about what he read in the paper about the tariff. I hope you'll forgive him for that terrible thing he said to you this morning. No better than a killer. After Mrs. Hammond had left, reluctantly, to visit ancient Mrs. Hannivan, the home's only centenarian, who was in her room and feeling poorly and had asked especially for Mrs. Hammond, after she had left, a thought occurred to Mr. Richards, which was very attractive to him. Namely, that Mr. Harry Hammond wasn't the only one who could take a nap. Stanley C. Richards could take one, too, if he liked, and at the moment he liked to very much. He got up and went to the elevator. He felt very tired. Last night his roommates had been even noisier than usual. Tonight might be no better. There was no possibility of finding another room. There simply were no vacancies, as Mrs. Fisher, the home's director, pointed out when he spoke to her. And as for any of the single men in the other rooms changing with him, why should any of them be so foolish? They knew very well why he wanted to swap. The only possibility was if one of them should die. Old Tom Scorby had a bad heart. Mr. Kingsley could barely shuffle one foot ahead of the other. Mr. Manning... Stanley C. Richards reproached himself for such a gruesome notion. 
The elevator got to the top floor, hottest in summer, coldest in winter, and he went to his room. He almost smiled in anticipation of his waiting bed as he opened the door. But someone was sitting on his bed. Mr. Harry Hammond. Mr. Hammond started, jumped a little bit on seeing him. His expression had been pensive, but now he smiled. This is an unexpected pleasure, said Mr. Richards. You think so? Glad you think so, Hammond chuckled. Just my little joke. Don't mind me. Mr. Richards said he wouldn't, only I was planning to take a nap and you're sitting on my bed. Elaborately, his guest rose, walked over to the nearest chair, waved Richards to the vacated bed. But before you go to sleep, he said, I have an apology to make. Yes, sir, he said contentedly. I did you wrong this morning. What I called you, I mean. I take it back. I take it all back, Richards, every bit of it. Mr. Richards sat down slowly on his bed and looked at his tormentor. After a moment, he said, Thank you. Mr. Hammond waved his hand, widened his smile. I'd like to get some information. I'm sure you can tell me. You tell everybody a lot of, well, a lot of things. You've been telling it to us for, oh, eight years now, isn't it? That you've been here? Yes. Eight years. I admire the way you talk. You're command of the language. It flows out of you. You're so eloquent. You're a regular old man eloquent, aren't you? Mr. Richards was puzzled, not so much by his guest's manner, which was plainly hostile, but by his purpose. I didn't get much sleep last night, he said. What was the information you wanted? Which side were you on? Mr. Hammond asked carefully. In the first Balkan War, if I might inquire. The Greek side. Why? When was this? The first Balkan War, I mean. Mr. Richards frowned. Oh, 1912, 1913? Shortly before the First World War. Why do you... And you were in the Second Balkan War. And the First World War. And the Polish-Russian War. And various... Chinese revolutions and all those different Latin American revolutions. And, oh, yes, let's not forget that Gran Chaco War between Bolivia and Uruguay and Paraguay. Paraguay, sorry, in the 30s sometimes. Frankly, I don't remember exactly anymore. I could look it up for you. What's all this about, Mr. Hammond? In a low, intense voice as filled with hate and venom as was his face, Mr. Hammond said, You're a liar. Richards got up. I don't know what you want out of me, he said. I think you're a pretty lucky fellow. You've got a lovely, intelligent wife. You've got a nice big room all to yourselves, a quiet room with a view where it's peaceful at night. I've got nobody. What? You don't deserve to have anybody. You're a liar. Spent 25 years as a soldier of fortune all over the world, did you? Did you? Why, you get out of here, Mr. Hammond. Scrambling to his feet, Mr. Hammond headed for the door, his face scowling. He turned around and said, but I'll fix you. I'll show you up for the bluffer and the four flusher you are. He took something from his pocket, held it up. It was a watch. You left this in the downstairs men's room when you washed your hands for lunch, and I found it. He dangled it triumphantly. It was too far away to be seen clearly in the dwindling light, but its owner did not have to see it clearly to know what was engraved on the back. Mr. Hammond had left, was punching the elevator button in the hall, but his parting words still rang in Mr. Richard's ears. Wait till they see this. Wait. Another voice came faintly up the shaft. Can't take you now. We've got the food carts to take care of. The sick and bedridden were being served their suppers earlier than the other residents as usual. Mr. Hammond's feet went slap, slap, slapping toward the stairs. Suddenly, Mr. Richards ran out, ran after him. Hammond turned around, his face becoming defiant. Richards grabbed for the watch, but Hammond quickly pulled away his hand. For a few seconds, they stood there face to face. Many thoughts ran through Mr. Richards' mind. Then 
he came to a decision. With one abrupt and utterly effective movement, he pushed Mr. Hammond down the stairs. Mr. Hammond fell down, fell forward, his mouth open on a long, long sound which never became a word. He landed with a dull noise and continued falling, limbs quite loose, stair after stair, until he rolled to a stop at the bottom of the landing. Mr. Richards was right after him. The watch was still ticking. As Mr. Richards looked almost incuriously at the dead man's face, he had time for a brief reflection. Naturally, it would be a shock to Mrs. Hammond, but her bereavement would not be without compensations. She would not have to put up with Harry Hammond's selfishness and vile temper any longer. There would be a funeral, and she could make all the arrangements to her heart's content. Flowers, hymns, guest lists, everything. And henceforth, she could visit Greenlawn Cemetery as often as she liked. There would be one more grave to which she could bring flowers and see that everything was nicely cared for. One more well-kept grave over which she could say a little prayer, and then afterward have a cup of tea in the nice clean coffee shop nearby. Of course, there was bound to be a certain amount of loneliness at first. She would feel it, she was bound to, particularly when she was by herself in the Hammond double room. The one with the lovely view the nice, quiet one, where no old men cried out, no old men coughed forever, no old men moaned aloud the whole sleepless night through. Moving very quickly, Mr. Richards swept up the watch and put it in his pocket. Later, he would have the back replaced. It would not do. It would never, never do to have anyone else see the words engraved there. Words he knew by heart. Half a century of faithful service, 1900 to 1950, Stanley Carl Richards, Accounting Department, Walton and Company. Mr. Richards lifted his head. Help, he shouted. Help somebody get a doctor quick. Mr. Hammond fell down the stairs. Feet came running, voices were loud, but Mr. Richards scarcely heard them. What would a proper interval of time be? Three months? Six? He would let events take their course. Now that he was sure, he could be patient. It would not be long. She would be lonely all by herself in that pleasant double room, that quiet room with a view. He knew already what his opening words would be. Mrs. Hammond. Alice. That was a nice name. It fitted her. Alice. Do you think you could bring yourself to marry a killer? Of the, um, we were talking about the detail and the economy of this story and uh, not telling a lot, but just showing. And I was wondering what you thought about like this, this mystery structure, because it's really hard to tell that it's a mystery until the very end, and then it's all uh, obvious. But how, how did you like that as the structure? Um, well, for me, I really liked being left in the dark mm. until the end. Um, I felt like there, the psychological treatment of the of the story, because mm. I think it was, was it 1964 it was written? Mm. It, felt, it felt very much like that. It felt a little Twilight zone -y to me. Oh, yeah. And, um, which I really liked. And I, I liked this idea of not understanding the motive until the action is in motion. And I felt like maybe even the actor himself, the person that's doing the acting, this th that's taking the motion, mm -hmm. doesn't even seem to realize his motive until he's already made that choice to push. It's yeah. almost like, you know, I think he had he had some early thoughts about what he what he was capable of. <clears throat> but he didn't, there was a moment when I think he makes that decision and he thinks, oh, I'm, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so, um, so I feel like <clears throat> we get taken along with him in that way. And I, I liked, I liked not, not knowing. And I, um, I didn't have a clue, honestly, like that that's what 
what was going to be the outcome of the story, which for me means it's a good story. Yeah. Oh my God. My, my boyfriend sprinted into the kitchen, which is where I was reading this story. And it's like, what are you okay? When I read that, <laughs> then he pushed him down the stairs. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so intense too. Like he's, and he just emitted a sound as he bounced down every step until the bottom. That was really intense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what? This also speaks, this stuck out to me um, to speak to your economy and the method in which um, Auburn's telling these things is that the way we found out, find out that Mr. Hammond is, is dead is just when he says, um, writes, the watch was still ticking as Mr. Richard looks almost incuriously at the dead man's face. Just that one adjective dead mm -hmm. in front of that's all we get that he's dead. And then that's all. And then it was time for a brief reflection. <laughs> <laughs> it was time for a brief reflection. Yeah. Um, I like how we're, like you said, too, we watch Mr. Richards kind of come to this act, you know, and we're not sure there's, there doesn't seem to be any intention to murder a man at the beginning of this. Uh, we just get little exposures that um, he's, up to something. Mr. Richards is up to something. He's been in like seven wars, eight wars, but everyone at this retirement community is listening to him. They love his storytelling. But then we start to see, wait a second, uh, he's really lonely. He's in this room surrounded by men like hacking up their lungs. He can't sleep because it's noisy all night. So his, he could use a better place to live. He could mm -hmm. uh, use a companion and he and Mrs. Hammond are great friends. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hammond is an ass. Sorry, Mr. Hammond is not a very nice person. And uh, then we finally figure out his story, his, uh, this whole thing he's been telling everyone is going to be, the jig is up and it's all going to be exposed. Yeah. yeah. So it makes, he's, he's, he makes that kind of split second decision to save everything and take advantage of everything just to push him down the stairs. Yeah. Intense. Yeah. Laura, did you have any spidey senses tingling? Were you suspicious of any of the characters <laughs> of all the ones? In I really wasn't. Um, and I think initially I was, if I was questioning anybody, I think it was maybe Mr. Hammond at first, because he was kind of Thanks. like, he's kind of an ass. Mm -hmm. And um, he seemed like he was jealous. He was dour. He was cranky. Mm -hmm. um, even with his, like his, his interactions with his wife as she expressed them were were not very nice and just I, limiting her and um and he I think he was jealous of Mr. Richard's success within that group like you were saying because he, he didn't have and, and even his wife pinpointed he didn't have anything really to share other than what was in the paper in front of him hmm. and I think they were there together for eight years if I'm remembering correctly um so I I had if I thought if anybody was going to do something bad, it was going to, it was going to be him. Um, oh yeah. I was but, like, yeah. he's in his bedroom. Let's mm -hmm. see what's going to go down. Yeah. I was like, no, don't touch, don't touch my friend, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Richards, <laughs> don't touch Richard. I was so loyal to him yep. and then so betrayed with yep. that one line at the end or not at the end, the line, but just the accounting department, which I do think is mm. more boring than the linen job. I, <laughs> I agree yeah, with you. Point. I thought the same thing. I was like, he had a very boring life Yeah. <laughs> with the watch to show for it and no partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you know, he's ended up in this like garret room with a view of a whatever chimney. I can't remember, but something Come not on. very nice with three men he doesn't really want to be with. Yeah. 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 Dang. I never made the connection, this is totally as I know, between the clock at the beginning and the watch at the end. Oh, that's good. Do you think there's anything profound mm -hmm. there? It just came to me. I think I'm it's sure. bookend bookending the story. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, I didn't think about that either. Well, what would you make of it? Not to put you on the spot. Well, I think in, there's a, for me, like, there's a bigger theme of like, um, I guess if I were thinking about one of the big themes is like the loneliness of mm -hmm. time passing and the loneliness of becoming infirm and getting old and measuring your 
your time with time, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. always, you know, and they probably measure things, the activities that they do do by time, you know, it's dinner time, it's lunch time, it's walk in the park time. And I think that um, the clock is probably really indicative of that. And it, I didn't pick up on that at all, but I think it's a really good point. And also just being displaced. They're kind of displaced, like they're not in their homes, you know, they're in this mm. like adopted, adopted space. Is it Alexandra's mm -hmm. home yeah. for married couples and men. single men or something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have it here somewhere, but I'm not gonna mm. go through it. Oh, and what one of your mean? details too that I just I just want to do a little word shout out to to, to uh, um in the Harmon. Yes, in the Harmon. Like, do you remember that where um Mrs. Darling had asked uh to tell the story about the Turks and the the Harmon, mm. not the hair and I thought she meant harem, but then it, they kept saying it. And so I was like, oh, I gotta look up what this word means. But then this back and forth happens. And uh, he writes, their eyes met sharing the joke for a moment. And I was like, whew, I wasn't on the joke. <laughs> okay, great. Oh. I wasn't. So That's, small, it's so small. Yeah, th this story is full of little jokes. Like there's the other joke, because Mr. Richards is always talking about his past. Well, it doesn't actually happen. His fake past, his whole story. And he tells a long extended joke. And there's a lot of like the, again, showing, not telling the different groups who are either siding with Richards or hating Richards. They just keep talking mm -hmm. over each other. Like it's political story and then it's chicken thighs and then it's political story. And then it's a joke that no one's in on and he has to explain. Um, yeah, really interesting kind of, um, relationships going on between the people here and some of them are very with it and some are kind of glazed over the whole time but did you guys like did you like a particular I mean we all like Mr. Richards I guess but who's your favorite character Richards Anna? Laura that's awesome. no oh, that's I, awesome. I I I I <laughs> I'm glad I'm gonna say that Mr. Richards is that I felt for him because he couldn't get any sleep <laughs> yeah <laughs> which you know I, I the beginning I thought oh the poor you know he had this like rotating cacophony of you know old men around him that could not he just couldn't he couldn't sleep and and mm -hmm. that is that is terrible so I felt for him <laughs> um, initially yeah. I liked him I loved how simple uh, Mr. Palumbo was, even though he mm. was keeping him up late at night with his market and his just, yeah. he, he had his life and he loved it and it was so simple and he missed it. And I thought that was really sweet. And I think the person I probably identify with is um, Mrs. Hammond because she's the most kind of straight shooter, I guess there, mm. but um, yeah, I mean, initially probably Mr. Richards. And then, as you said, Emma, we were all let down huge letdown yeah you, and I knew it was in it's in the investigation like I knew yeah. something was gonna happen yeah and I'm not ready I was so naive <laughs> 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 oh another literary thing um is this uh, about Mr um the Mr Bigelow with the the produce store mm. uh, just a little I just went to that section when you said that um when the they're talking about the sequence of things and now it's Mr. Bigelow's turn Mr. Uh, Mr. Bigelow woke up uh, old Amadeo and Amadeo is just talking about uh let's see um uh he realized he could never return with to the basement of the, the cool basement of the store with the coolness so good for the beautiful fruit for the lovely vegetables and the sweet familiar smell of them the familiar customers who had served he had served for more than a generation the old neighborhood faults and all which had been ah the fatal change of tense oh yeah had been <laughs> mm. more, more than a home so I sad that too. yeah i love that too I really liked Mrs. Hammond and her, the relationship between Mrs. Hammond and Mr. Richards kind of reminds me, uh, Em and I, like last week we read the third sacred wall of the temple. And it's the same mm -hmm. thing where you're like, 
there's not going to be a murder. There's not going to be a murder. There's not going to be a murder. And then someone just pushes someone, kills them. And in that story, we, we notice like every character in this town is a complete failure and they've come here to hide. Why? And oh it's like, my God. Yeah. It's like, why? You're so why, right. Why are we focusing on that detail? And then this time I was like, why are they, why do they keep in this story? Why do they keep talking about loving to plan funerals and loving the graveyard and that little coffee shop that's so nice next to the graveyard and then when Mr. Richards kills Mr. Hammond he's like you know I don't feel so bad because now Mrs. Hammond can plan his funeral can go to her favorite coffee shop to visit him every week I've done the right thing like he's facilitating her happiness yeah, <laughs> yeah. in his <laughs> mind in his mind one stare at a time <laughs> Yeah, I, um, now that we're, I'm reflecting on it, eventually I end up at a very, I sympathize a lot with Mr. Hammond because mm. I also would not want to think all the time about death if I was in a retirement home to go there. Oh, yeah, like that's he, true. It was funerals and he didn't, he didn't want to go to anyone's funeral. He didn't want to go to um, the graveyard, even though he mm. loved all these people. He didn't even like like that tension. I emphasize, I empathize with that fear of like wasting your life or whatever. That mm. feeling comes up. That feeling that comes up. I can feel that. I can understand that jealousy. Um, and now that, but I that door to me empathizing with him is only open after my allegiances to Mr. Richards have gone out the window. Mm. I did not think about that at all. That's interesting. Like he even has a fit when he has to think about going to a funeral. It shuts him down mm -hmm. and he's like, I don't know, he's trembling, but he has to go to bed. I thought he was just being kind of a jerk. And I was like, why would you not let your wife go see one of her best friends and plan her funeral? But it really does mm -hmm. disturb him, this idea of death, which he meets anyway. He can't avoid it. Yeah, hmm. yeah. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's a huge, that's a huge thing that I read about in, in the intro. It's very short. Mm. I read it, but I kind of wish I didn't read it like you didn't, Laura, because it does kind of prepare me for like, oh, I'm going to be a little bit sad and existential. Oh, yeah. But I'm not one. And then, but then, the, and then I couldn't enjoy the part about the chicken thighs as innocently. Um, because I knew it was in contrast to the the end or which or the end of all ends. So um, just back to the chicken thighs in the small the small details. Are there any like particular quotes, particular sections that you would want to focus on with a class or a student? Hmm. Oh, for me, yeah, I um, definitely the two aspects like we were talking about, I would focus on the details and then this how much is shown without having to explain anything. And the details around the food, um, I'm trying to pull up that the 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 part about so getting getting into the chicken and asking. So let's see, it's Mr. Hammond appealing to Mrs. Darling to talk about chicken because he wants to interrupt Mr. Richard. So he gets, sets her off. He knows it, it, she's described. And I took this down because I thought this was kind of funny. She's Mrs. Darling is described as a featureless dumpy woman, though inoffensive enough. Whereas Mrs. Hammond is a very good looking person. Her skin still firm and pink and her snow white hair neatly set. So Mrs. Darling, he sends her off on a side note, talking about chicken with great detail and she starts to talk about how she prepares the chicken and it's I think this would make a great stage moment I mean I feel mm. like the mm. I see it on stage and I think that um it could be very comical as she's just talking about like a this little plump woman and she's talking about how much she loves food she loves chicken here's how she prepares it oh your husband loves it and the details about um really the parts that I, that stood out to me the most are when she's describing her preparation of the food. So like, um, you used to love the way I made the mashed potatoes. I mashed, put in a little milk, a little buttermilk, salt and pepper, a nice big lump of butter. And then I'd mix it all together. I'd be frying a nice onion. You know, she gets into the whole thing and sets the whole course of the discussion off and away from, uh, where they were hoping it would go. And so it's quite, it's quite funny and it's very effective and that those details are just excellent. Mm 
Oh man. So when you mentioned it being on stage, that's really cool. When we talked with Zach, we were also thinking, wow, lots of Avram stories really would work well on a stage. Uh, and that's what we ended up going with, with the, the final question, you know, if you were going to turn this into theater or into a Netflix series, uh, who would you go with? We went with stage, but I want to ask you now, like, who would you cast? How would you do it? How would you produce this? Okay, so I have two options for you okay. because I couldn't decide on one. I went old school for option A. Hmm. I would have Mr. Richards played by one of my all-time favorites, Cary Grant. He can do both. He can do slapstick, but he can also be, uh, you know, he was in charade and he was, he was, he plays a good mystery man. Yeah, Mr. Hammond, money. Mr. Hammond would be played by Jimmy Stewart. Okay. Mrs. Hammond would be played by Catherine Hepburn. So you've got your holy trinity there. <laughs> I have Mr. Darling played by John Wayne. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> And Mrs. Darling played by Lucille Ball, although she's not featureless or dumpy. She was lovely, but she does a good, she could talk about that chicken. I think she would do a good job. Oh, and I would have the three roommates played by the Marx Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> my option B is a modern take. And this, my, I, I always had this person in mind to play Mr. Richards. And then I had to set up everyone else around him, but I had to make sure that it made sense. So Mr. Richard is Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, oh, oh. okay. Oh and then I thought, nice. okay, but I want to assemble a Wes Anderson story. Can I do that with him? And I can, because he's in some upcoming movie that's coming out or recently that's come out. So if, if age were no issue, if I could put whoever I wanted in there, I'd have Benedict Cumberbatch be Mr. Richards. Bill Murray would be Mr. Hammond. Ooh, ooh. Mrs. Hammond would call back one of my other favorite movies. We'd get Scarlett Johansson to play Mrs. Hammond. Ooh, uh, good. Get Bump. her back in there with Bill. Um, Mr. Darling, I made uh, Owen Wilson take that one because he can get very um, persnickety. He does a good job of being very particular. Mm. I have Mrs. Darling, this is a strange one, but she has been in Wes Anderson films. I have her being played by Meryl Streep because she can do anything. Um, and I have the three roommates as Luke Wilson, Jason Schwartzman, and Ben Stiller. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, wait, wait, hold on. Let's go into this then. <laughs> which of the three stooge roommates is which between Ooh. Ben, Luke, and the third? I think I would want to make the fruit and veg guy maybe, oh, that's a tough one. I think he might be Ben Stiller. Mm. Yes. Columbus could I be Ben Stiller. And then, yeah, I don't know about the other two. It's kind of a toss up for me. What do you guys think? I think Luke Wilson would be coughing the whole time. I thought, I, I was like, I could see doing a whole five minutes of coughing in the garden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just would not want it to end. <laughs> poor luke wilson keep talking buddy <laughs> i think that's excellent okay oh my totally imagine meryl streep now when when mr hammond mentions an apple turnover is nice and she goes oh yes <laughs> i can just imagine her going for this next monologue and then she gets cuts off the cross is flaky oh, and so many words in here it's side and totals i know are italicized mm -hmm. and it just made a difference you know mm -hmm. oh, have I that love that yeah okay yeah <laughs> well thank wow, you that's high budget we we got to talk to seth about that i, I know yeah, that's a big budget yeah <laughs> a lot of holograms <laughs> <laughs> maybe they can do it as a radio play Mm, that, that would be a good radio play honestly man i really think that now that you're you are you and zach have brought stage into my mind stage is where it's at for this one yeah yeah they should, oh my god we could have a little short like a not a play or not a, we should have full play of short avram stories whoa damn with the vaudeville in the middle. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the vaudeville goobers, break, middle. Get the, yeah, mm-hmm. the vaudeville with the goobers. We read a story last time called the goobers and they're just tiny mole people and they, they could show up. There you go. Vaudeville. Yeah. Oh, they love that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great casting. I think, I think that's the way we're going to roll with it. A or B. Very good. Uh, yeah. Laura Scott, thank you very much for coming on the album Davidson universe. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug anything you're working on? Not at the moment. Just okay. keep writing, everyone. Keep reading. Cool. Thanks for keep having me. Reading. Thanks, Laura. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye. Oh, I Bye. suppose God only knows It sounds like a story to me Some crazy fable